happened in the 90s. Uh... Matt was the fat kid, he was the flat kid. Life wasn't always great, but you know what was? The 90s happened in the 90s. Yeah! Good, don't bend too hard on the legs. Yeah, that, that's close enough. Okay, who knows what a two-point landing is? Oop, sorry. Okay, is this bad? I got a tangle. All right. You jump! Why don't you, uh, I got an idea. Why don't you jump? Yes, you can do this, now jump! He's training for his biggest adventure yet. Oh yeah, he's ready. Come on, yeah. trust me! Yeah. Jump! I say you got that insurance for him. Thanks, Rod. Yeah, yeah thanks, Rod. PlayStation. You know, one of the things I love about our TikTok followers, they leave Easter eggs from time to time, Matt. I like Easter eggs. Yeah, yeah things, things that kind of doesn't catch my attention, but they, they draw attention to it. And it's like, oh, my God, I, I should have been known that. So, like, the clip where we're talking about parenthood and you ask, like, who the hell is this TK character? Well, how, how did he just pop up? And, you know, w one of the followers that commented, he said that uh, it's the Fresh Prince effect. And just like Will Smith joined his auntie and uncle in Bel Air and he became like a part of the family, uh, the same yeah. thing happened with TJ in Parenthood with Robert and, and Jerry. And uh, also uh, Growing Pains, uh, Leo, he did the same deal. He, he was a kid from the beaten path and, uh, you know, the Seaver family, they took him in. And then I forgot about oh, Cousin Pam, Cousin Pam on the Cosby show. Uh, she would eventually be Max, Max, or is it a... Uh, Maxine Shaw, attorney at law, yeah. But before oh, that, on, oh, on Living Single, yeah. Before that, she she was Cousin Pam on the Cosby Show. And there's around that time, Fresh Prince came on air. So, yeah. I don't, I don't know if that is one of those things that's an official thing, but Fresh Prince effect, I like that. I like the, I, first of all, that's a great call out. I don't know if that's widely recognized, but that's that sounds, that's great. And I love the idea that Fresh Prince was such a great show and a great idea that it created its own writing trope that people use to make successful TV shows, movie. You know, I guess you could call it biting off of that, but I love that call out. What a great Easter egg, Steve. What a who I wish do we have a name of the the fan that pointed this out cuz that's they must be like a professor of TV or something at some collegiate university they do follow us on tiktok so that will suffice it's about the same, it's about equivalent yeah um you know and, and it's it's somewhat similar to another trope where you know halfway through the season the youngest kid uh grows out of that cuteness and starts to become all pre-adolescent and getting acne and shit so then they bring in like another like a, a, a younger all of a sudden the, the wife now in her mid 40s she's pregnant again because we got to have a new baby in this house this, the, the youngest one lost her cuteness his or her cuteness so you're like let's have a miraculous jesus baby and yeah <laughs> we'll be some we'll be 50 year old parents a la uh step by step well i mean that's hilarious but did that happen in like let's look at full house steve I guess it did because Uncle Jesse had those two kids. Oh, yep, exactly. the twins. Wow. Wow. Happened on Roman Pains. Wow! Yeah, didn't they have a little girl? Was it a little girl after the the one dude grew up? The little curly haired girl. Yeah, Ben, you're looking weird. Er, yeah. Now, so yeah, let's bring in a new kid. They did it. They tried it with Mary with Children, and they called attention to it, like as if Bud was ever cute. But. Uh, <laughs> But they brought in like a little kid named Seven or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. I and think we covered like, that actually, or we at least covered that portion of it. Cause I definitely remember editing in that kid. Cause you know, there's not a lot of pictures of him. I think he only shows up like twice. And then he just disappeared by next season. Hey, that's how good the nineties were though. They were like, that's when they figured it all out and people just, we got to roll with this. We got, we got, they're growing up, Mary Kate, Ashley. It's too old. It's getting weird. Let's get some fucking young meat in here. That sounded weird. You know, tone down the language a little bit. <laughs> tone down the language. Uh, Dude, she's talking about titties. Here comes Cousin Ricky. 
That's hilarious. But it makes sense. I mean, we've we watch these shows and we see all these amazing episodes of TV. I mean, it makes sense. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if it makes money, copy it. You know? Copy and paste, man. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that, though. I love the fan base because, you know, we're old men. Maybe we smoke a little too much pot here and there. But uh, so we're going to miss some stuff. But I love people catching these things that we miss and even pointing out things. I never would have thought that. I'm not that deep. Uh, Yeah, we're getting calls about a wild party over here. Know anything about it? I didn't think so. Which one of you jokers goes by the name Mario? It's a me. Could you step outside, please? Welcome to Mario Party, where you and three friends battle it out all night long. With six adventure boards and 50 mini games, this party's just getting going. Mario Party, only on Nintendo 64. But it's a me, Mario. Yeah, tell it to the judge. Get in, get out. Hey, boys and girls, this is Steve G and Mad G with Happened in the 90s, a show where we talk about what happened in the 90s. So get out your Buster Bunny t-shirts and your Best of Buster Douglas tapes. And everybody, move your body. Now do it. Here is something that's going to make you move and groove. Hey, DJ, playing that song all night. On and on and on. On and on and on and on. How is it pronounced, Steve? Jeanne. Jeanne. I like that they put it right on the album, though. It's in the title. Jeanne, or whatever. They spell it out, and then they give you the phonetics. And I appreciate that. It's a, a white guy who can't pronounce anything foreign. It's nice. Rocking the baldy way before Jada. Looking sexy. I mean, I'm going to have to look at I'm only seeing album art, but these two ladies look very... Uh, you know, I wouldn't kick him out of bed for eating crackers, Steve. Well, today, my friend, we're talking about all things February 15th. In the 90s, Matthew G. Starting off in 1990, Cheers is airing Season 8, Episode 18, Severe Crane Damage. Lilith goes on a talk show to promote her new book about men who are bad for women and takes along her prime example, Sam Malone. I don't like this. I like this episode, Steve, but it, it twists a knife in my side that's been there for a, my whole life, which is women loving a bad boy and not, you know, I don't like to be compared to an old shoe. Uh, don't don't really appreciate that. But, you know, the whole bad boy thing, not appreciating that, Steve. And we get that in full effect. Yeah, it, it spoke to the soul with this one, man. You know, n- now you, you coming to me with your with your stuff looking like Arby's roast beef, and, and maybe a child or two on the way that that you was just getting beat up and abused by Joe Jackson all through your twenties, and now you come to me. You're like just like how we don't like to be referred to as, as ratty old house shoes. They don't like to be referred to as uh, bitter betties, and that's what we receive, us good guys, us soul and comfort per- people. Yeah. We care about your feelings. We we want yeah. you to you know be happy. These guys want to dick you down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this guy's got. He's just getting out of jail. I gotta give him a shout again. Oh my God, you got warrants! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my God! But you know, this also has a through line, Steve, because we're going to be talking about pills a lot this episode, and in this episode of Cheers. One Cliff Clavin's coming to the bar, and he's he's downing pills. Steve, he might as well be a Midwestern housewife. He's just popping these things like they're fucking certs. You know, he's got a rash or something. I don't know. He's got some kind of issue going on. Maybe some uh, HPV or something. He's taking some pills, but he's taking a lot. He's taking a handful of these things in one gulp. And uh, yeah, it's a rash on his lower back. And he says that it's job related. You know, it, it's one of them things. And uh, Fraser and then Lilith, they show up. And Lilith, she's authored a new book, Good Girls, Bad Boys. Isn't that cute, Fraser says. Well, that was the editor's idea. 
Lilith yeah. wanted to call it a cross-sectional study of control group females with a tendency towards self-destruction vis-a-vis damaging relationships with members of the opposite sex. Yeah, that's, you know, they had to bring it down. A, you got to edit that down a little bit. But, you know, as always, Lilith, just a cold, just ice queen of a woman. Very, like, factual, very just by the book. And she's going on a, not only has she got a book out, she's got to do a little press. And she's got to go on a TV show. So they're kind of doing some pre-gaming at the bar, as you will. So you have to get ready for that, you know. And everybody's everybody's fascinated. They're going. And uh, Frazier's, like, talking to everybody, explaining this. And Sam, I think, just as, like, a courtesy, he's like, oh, that be that sounds fun. Frazier's like, oh, okay, well, uh, you want to go? I got two tickets, and uh, I want to, you know, show up for my wife. And Sam's like, eh. And Frazier, I love this. He's just like, I just don't want to be the only guy there. <laughs> Again, you're a psychiatrist. You should be over this, Frazier. You should be over all this, but... You know, he's got to have his buddy show up. And meanwhile, Cliff is still slamming those pills. And Norm looks at the side effects. It says, may cause gynocosomastia. Gynocomastia. Gynocomastia. <laughs> and they, they ask the, the village doctor, Frazier, hey, uh, what does that mean? And it, apparently it's male breast enlargement. It's going to grow some boobs, but Fraser's like, you get like, he looks at the pills. He's like, you don't, don't even worry about this. You'd be having to take like five times the dose for even for you to start blossoming. Hey, oh, but yeah, Cliff's, Cliff's about 10 servings deep into this, whatever you can't, I don't like this for Cliff. He just takes pills and thinks, Hey, they, they gave them to me. The more this is actually really good guy logic. Cause I've done this where you're like, well, two does this. If I take five of these things, problem solved. I'm cured. Probably yeah. even quicker than it would. No. Uh, they specialist. Double Ds, Steve. <laughs> and now they're at the talk show. And the book is dedicated to her husband, Lilith says. And the host asks, oh, is he a bad boy? Uh, no, actually the complete opposite. Yeah, and uh, then the host is like, so, you know, Who's that guy over next to your husband? Who's that? And then Sam gets pulled into the show and because he's the bad boy. Willis like, oh, that guy, he's the quintessential bad boy we're talking about. Constantly dicking chicks down, leaving them in the dust. It's just a rinse and repeat situation. So now this woman's like Ricky Lake type shit where she's like, ooh, okay. Now we need to explore this. This whole book thing, that's cute. But we got a bad boy and a good boy up. Let's bring them both up. And let's talk to them. And this, I mean, this is where my skin crawls, Steve, because this is where they're just putting it to the good boy. Frazier's getting it. And they asked Sam, so what could a woman expect from dating you? And he's like, I don't know if I should say on TV, but he whispers in her ear and you could tell she's turned on. She's like, oh, maybe you should have wrote a book. Tell I mean, the one woman's like... Um, yeah, or, or the, I think the host was like, let's get a real question here. And the one one's like, yeah, c- cute. Um, to the bad boy, Sam, what do you look like with your shirt off? That's, that's the serious question they get. These women, he's literally, the PJ's fa- like falling down the audience steps to Sam's feet. And he's seeing this. Frazier's up there just being ignored. They're like, hey, what do you, like, he tells them what his night is. And he's like, it's going to be simply, what does he say? It's something so hilarious. Uh, well, he does, he does mention that he used to date a girlfriend of Sam's, but she broke up with him and got engaged back with Sam. But the girl was nuts. Well, and he also, when he says what his night of passion is going to be, he can't even think anything. This man's like a wordsmith. He gets up there. He's nervous. He's the good boy. And all he can spit out is, it'll be jolly good fun. Yeah, that's going to make some women's panties, you know, drop. Saying that. Also, Sam, I do also, this guy is, a, he's a, a sports athlete. He's used to the spotlight. He's, he's comfortable. He's got his foot up on the seat. When he's getting the love, he starts like crowd work and everybody. He's like, you know what? You guys are great. Whole third row. I'm going to give you some dick. Come over, you know, let's party. It's crazy. This is one of the weirdest episodes of whatever this show is. 
ever. And Sam's going to get a lot of numbers after it. And I, you know, respect to him, but come on. Even Lilith hops on his bones in front of her husband. How dare she? On but, TV. Uh, yeah, that that was, I mean, she's completely, she's like, he's just, ta- I forget, was she explaining like what it's like to make love to? I forget what it is, but by the end of the explanation, she's like, just take me, you son of a bitch. And it's yeah. near pornographic on this morning talk show. <laughs> Come on, Fraser Crane, get a spine. But back at the bar, do something bad? No, why? Because you want me to? No. Cause Sam, he's got a harem just lined up, and he's just fucking with them. You, you, you want me to? You want me to do this? No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, actually, no, that's I a will. Lie. <laughs> I'm a bad boy. Yeah, I'm going to do it, psych, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and Frazier's watching all this. He's just doing some paperwork, Steve. He's got a whole thing going on. He looks like a homeless person at Starbucks. He's got the whole table to himself. And we find out he's actually writing his own book now. He, the whole show, he, he doesn't care about that. That was stupid. That's in the past. He's writing a new book. Um, and, you know, I think it's, he's got some hard feelings here, Steve, but he's not ready to just explore that yet. He's trying to be professional. He's a psychiatrist. And he asked Rebecca if she thinks he's a good boy. She's like, yeah, why do you think you're inferior? Because you're good. Give me a pair of old ratty old house shoes any day. Oh, so you think I'm just some old slippers? Huh, would a good boy do this? And then he proceeds to run around the bar with scissors. Huh, you know what? I'm going to go swimming after I eat lunch. And then I'm going to go around and pet just random strange dogs. Yeah, I don't even know where they've been. Yeah. <laughs> Show you good boy. I'm going to eat one more. I'm going to eat a whole Reese's peanut butter cup and not just half. I'm doing it all. (laughs) I also like that Sam, he's like talking about this book. He's like, yeah, I just thought I'd put my hat in the ring of, uh, you know, this psychiatrist game, this whole book thing. And Sam's like, you sure this isn't about the whole show and just being embarrassed? And Fraser's like, no, not at all. And then he sees that the book's called uh, Nice Psychiatrist Who Marry Castrating Shrew Pond Scum or something crazy. And, uh, you know, Fraser. I think it's going to be a bestseller. I'd read it, Steve. <laughs> Sounds like a doom gloom. But uh, yeah, man. And, and Cliff, he's still pounding those pills. And he's talking to Norm's like, ah, I caught you staring at my chestal region. <laughs> They're no bigger than they were earlier today. But Norm's scoping. I mean, his buddy, his best friend's about to have some just straight d cup so you know i guess that's a win for him he's gonna get to look at him. <laughs> yeah some mandibles and uh <laughs> cliff, rebecca pops up she's like why you always got to give cliff a hard time why does he have to be the butt of our stupid jokes you know cliff i was taking pills for a skin problem one time and uh, it turned out miraculous i it, the, the results were beautiful here i am now fucking rebecca look who's talking but doesn't she say she was a boy before that she started taking the pills? <laughs> yeah. Always you, joking on Cliff. Um, <clears throat> and then we, you know, cut to later. Because nobody ever really leaves this bar. I mean, this bar needs to have some beds put into it. All these sauced up alcoholics just hanging out constantly. Lilith comes in. She's... I mean, I guess she's scared. She has no emotion in her voice, but Frazier never, she's not, they had an appointment, not for a, a date. They schedule appointments for sex and Frazier, he missed the 8.30. Um, Lilith's worried. She goes, to, I think, to call somebody. And as she disappears, the sound of a fucking just wild hog just coming to park in front of the bar. We hear, we hear the motorcycle, we hear it turn off. And then in walks, I don't know if Frazier walks in first or Viper, but Frazier's a biker now, Steve. Within, how, did he buy the fucking motorcycle? I think he's just giving it a test ride. It might be Viper's bike, but her real name's Ellen. And uh, apparently she calls him Flash, but he's expressing his inner gonzo self, he says. But 
Apparently, Woody used to be in, yeah, he used to be in a biker gang too. And Viper asked him, what bike? Uh, Schwinn. <laughs> um, so Viper, I mean, se- she's pretty sexy, Steve. You know, she's you take those chaps off. You take that vest off. I'm, she looks pretty cool. I don't know how Fraser met her. Maybe at the bike sh- store or rental spot. Um, but everyone's like, look at you, dude. Still married though, and then I feel like like they get in a conversation. Viper wants to go. Fraser's like, "Where are we going?" And she's I think she tells him they're going to Florida. And now Fraser's like, "Well, that's I mean that's crazy. That's how how long does wow. that take?" You know, he starts making up excuses, and then Viper says something either about maybe he mentions Lilith, and Viper's like, "Somebody married you." And then she starts sort of like saying mean stuff and Frazier starts defending Lilith. He's like, she's the most beautiful, intelligent, well-equipped woman. She's everything. And like defends her as Lilith's like coming out of the phone booth or wherever the back to call somebody. And she hears this. She hears her man defending her. And, you know, Frazier's like, you know what, Viper? You know, that blowjob on the back of the bike was cool and all, but gotta go good boys back if paying attention to your career and home and caring for your children if that's dull then call me the dullest man alive <laughs> and then that's when lilith comes around she's like oh fraser you are <laughs> and they embrace viper you know bikes off into the sunset and cliff possibly gonna have to go buy a training bra that night we don't know because we cut that's it well well, well, fun fact about this episode uh glenn beck he's in the opening scene he's uh sitting on the other side of the bar uh where they're doing the we will rock you instrumental oh yeah i love that that was a cool beginning honestly it's just like the sound of the bar creates we will rock you i love that yeah it was random you know glenn beck the political guy yeah he's He's on the opposite side. He's sitting next to a lady and he's wearing like a, a burgundy like suit jacket. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, you know, I don't give a fuck about Glenn Beck, but that's cool, I guess. <laughs> but that's a name I haven't heard. I feel like he even he's gone now. He's like, I don't know. He's pulling out. Yeah, I don't know. He must have. You don't hear Glenn <laughs> Beck anymore. I haven't heard that name in a while. That whole camp, yeah, as they should be. Uh, But in 1991, King Ralph premieres in theaters. A regular guy from America becomes King of England after a royal wipeout puts him next in line. Directed by David S. Ward, starring John Goodman, Peter O'Toole, and John Hurt. Solid movie. John Goodman at his finest. Maybe not his finest, but this this is it. You know, this is what we know and love. He's a lovable buffoon. He's American, basically. <laughs> He's a fat American who somehow has the blood of the royals in him uh, somewhere. Uh, and at the beginning of this, I think they're doing like a photo shoot for the whole royal family. And all yeah. of them are electrocuted to death. And that's why they just got to go. They got to find the next in line. And that's who it is. And, you know, over time, he realizes that this life isn't for him. He can't even go out to BK and get a Whopper. He can't even, like, dick down the chick that he likes. They, they, they give him this boring-ass chick from another country in the UK, and she actually sounds like a dude. She has a very hoarse uh, voice, man. I don't know if you've seen this recently, man, but the lady that they have him assigned with, um, yeah, yeah. It's, John, it's King Ralph, dude. He needs he needs to buck some blonde. He needs a yeah. stripper. Uh, this movie's just hilarious. Like, it, it's just I mean, it's just him doing American shit while British people are like, "Oh my god!" A lot of him like pl- I remember him playing piano at like a fancy dinner. I think he plays "Good Golly Miss Molly" or something, and just you know rocks yeah. the house. So a lot of that. It's John Goodman just eating up the scenery and who hates that you know we loves us some dan connor and ironically john candy was considered for the role of king ralph but coincidentally he ended up in a starring in nothing but trouble 
which also premiered on this same day in 1991, directed by Dan Aykroyd and uh, starring Chevy Chase, Dan Aykroyd, John Candy, and Demi Moore. Uh, a businessman and his friends are captured by a sadistic judge and his equally odd family in a bizarre mansion in the backwoods. This, I had, honestly, when I saw it, I was picturing something for whatever reason uh, with Tim Allen in it. I thought it was a Tim Allen joint. This is not what I was picturing. And when I saw the preview of it, I do want to watch this. It looks trippy as fuck. And there's a lot of people in it that I do like. And then there's Chevy Chase. And then there's Chevy Chase. You know, I, I gotta so say. that's tough. Well, I could send you the link after this, man. And I don't know any person that is less deserving of success that he's had than this motherfucker right here. He's just, I don't know, man. I know you're big on National Lampoon, but even with that, I feel like they created him like that. Like he is, a, he is like a Mickey mouse. Like he, you were crafted in a factory. Like none of your funny things initially came out of here. Like anything funny that you did, it was written by other people. It was other people's brainchilds. And you, you had the luck of being surrounded with more talented people than yourself. Twice as talented. You've worked with all of the greats from yesteryear and people of our time, like the the Bill Murrays, the John Belushi's, the Dan Aykroyd's. You you rubbed elbows with some of the greats, man. And I just never found this person funny. I never liked him in any of his SNL shit. He was only there for one year, and every time he comes back to host, he's an asshole. I mean, I don't famously, get I feel like the, uh, him and I think he came when he the first time he did come back to SNL after he left him and Bill Murray got it like in a physical fight because yeah. he's such a cunt and they've since gotten back, you know, or whatever, you know, I'm sure they reconciled in whatever way people their age do. But I kind of agree with you. I mean, there was a time and place like he was good at deadpan and he was there was a thing that he did well that for you know, the eighties, like when he was making movies like Fletch, those kind of things where it's kind of like, he was just like a sort of the funny straight man type thing. There's things like that, that I like, I like Caddyshack, but you're right. I mean, I don't think any of those came out of his head and other than him playing the same, like smarmy sort of prick, even if he's the good guy, he still has like an attitude problem. Um, yeah, I get it. But this movie is not just him. We get him, we get John Candy twice, because John Candy is in drag in this, too, playing, I think, the guy's, his sister. Granddaughter. Something, yeah, he's in there. So they make Chevy Chase have to romantically get involved with John Candy in drag, and I like that. Dan Aykroyd plays some kind of ghoulish, like, I don't know if he's the mayor or if he's, like, a judge. He looks like a judge. Okay. He's 106 years old. Yeah, and uh, I think Demi Moore is also in this. Yeah, Hottie she, Demi Moore. This is the, yeah, this is back when she was fine, fine, and um, yeah. Ironically, this is the film debut of Tupac Shakur. So you you uh, six degrees of separation, pure. Say uh, pull this ace ace in the hole. He's out of your in pocket, this man. movie. Digital that's, Underground. That's a screen grab from this movie. Him and Humpty Hump, and like before we did this movie man i i would see snapshots of this on facebook maybe the the other content creators knew this was the the anniversary was coming up i was like man what what movie is this from and sure enough while i'm watching this this is where the movie's yeah. from and this he's wearing a yankees jersey too so once upon a time he did support the east coast damn john candy got got to rub elbows with shock g and tupac i love that that's crazy. I didn't know that. Now I'm going to have to watch this for sure, for sure, just to see, just to get it. I mean, is it long? It, it's like typical comedy length, about hour, hour and a half, man. Okay. And, and this was this was the peak of the movie right here. They perform uh, Around the World. Uh, uh-huh. Like, oh my goodness, man. Like, it, it's pretty dope, man. Seeing a young Pac, seeing Shock G, a.k.a. Humpty Hump, do they thing, man. And Rubbing elbows with John Candy, Demi Moore, like who, you know? Dan Aykroyd, even in a weird ghoulish outfit. I mean, he was there. I read a little bit about this too when I was like just watching the previews and stuff. 
And weirdly, like, this movie had a huge budget for the time. Like, it had, like, almost like a 50 mil budget. They said yeah. the sets, because this is, there's, like, a junk, huge junkyard with, like, cars piled up and stuff. Like, those are legit sets that they built for this yeah. movie that, I mean, shit. I don't know if it was successful, but I've never heard of it. It's crazy. Maybe it's because of Chevy Chase. It's a Chevy Chase effect. They're just trying to bury all this shit. As they should. But uh, in 1992, serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer is sentenced in Milwaukee to 15 terms of life in prison. Rightfully so. Eating little, eating gay guys. Just doing crazy shit. Also, I got to say, one thing that was disappointing, I, I could give a fuck about Jeffrey Dahmer. It's an interesting story. The guy ate people. The guy was a lunatic, blah, blah, blah. I, you know, there was a rumor that he was killed in jail by having a broomstick rammed up his ass. And I've come to find out that's not true, Steve. A guy killed oh. him, but it wasn't in that way. And I do like every year whenever this story inevitably comes up about this guy, the guy who killed him does interviews talking about why he, he's like, that's his celebrity. He'll get interviews off of that. And, you know, he did everybody a favor. He did. This guy was a fucking lunatic. But he that guy's no longer with us either. But he Yeah, hey, but thank still. You. you know, thanks for thanks for taking out the trash, you know. God's plan. But in uh, 1993, Fresh Prince is airing season three, episode 19, Just Say Yo. A classmate gives tired Will amphetamines, which Carlton unwittingly takes. Mm-mm. Shame on you, Will. Another pill issue, Steve. This ain't a, this ain't about fucking rashes now. This is almost like a Jesse Spano level thing where it's just too much, oh, yeah. man. The schedule's too much. You gotta you need something to pick me up. There's not enough hours in the day. Get some Dexa trim. Get a little speed pill. Do a speed ball. You know. Hey, Will was just getting so excited. <laughs> The beginning of this is great. Um, we start, uh, Will's in the kitchen, people are milling about, and then this whole game of pass the garbage to somebody to take it out happens where, I gotta say, the garbage though, who's putting garbage in a, pl uh, a brown bag like that? Uh, but everybody's passing it around. I think Carlton says, do I look like rock? And I want to say, is he referencing the show Rock, Steve? Of course. Okay. Of course, yeah. Because even Will says, yeah, like, yeah, you just got to sand your head down and get the square parts out. <laughs> shave your hair off. <clears throat> I love that. Love a little reference to Rock. A little shout out to that. Um, it keeps going around. And then Will gets the, the garbage bag. And I love this. I mean, he's going to get pounded by fucking Uncle Phil, but... Uncle Phil walks by. Will's got this bag of garbage that looks like a big sack lunch. And he's like, hey, Uncle Phil, got your lunch. And, you know, Uncle Phil's a judge. He's busy. He just takes it and goes. But what happens after that? What's the aftermath of this, Steve? He opens it up. There's just, like, tampons and eggshells in it. I don't like that. Then cue that classic theme song. And then Will, in the next scene, he comes in double fisting. He's got a book in one hand and breakfast in the other. And between school and Cindy, uh, my, my job and Cindy, basketball and Cindy, shit, I don't know if I got enough time for Cindy. You might have to cut out one of the one of these just to give Cindy another hour or two. And Phil's like, dude, just you got to chill out. Take a little time off. You know, you don't want to wear yourself out. You're just a kid, which I love that. But I mean, you can't it's Cindy, Uncle Phil. I can't take a, I can't take that off. And that's, I got a lot of energy to burn on Cindy. He's got to work. He can't take time off of his job because he needs bread for the prom. He wants to look fly for Cindy. And then they're eating breakfast. <laughs> Carl Carlton walks in and is like, look at my face. And Will's like, man, we eat, man. <laughs> <laughs> but Carlton's got some kind of zit situation on his forehead. I can't see it. They didn't do makeup enough that I could even tell, which I think is also the joke. But the thing that I was like fascinated by in this is that maybe this is a 90s thing. Maybe this is something I never really dealt with, but they keep bringing up vitamin E as a way to get rid of 
zits. Is this, I mean, you're not a doctor, Steve, but is this something you ever heard of? Because I never heard of well, it. As a person who had really bad acne in his teens and early, in early adolescence, man, I never heard about this. And I took everything under the sun <laughs> yeah. from Clearasil to Oxypads to Noxzema, goddammit. <laughs> yeah, dude, I took those Oxypad things. Those things burnt. I was like, it has to be working because this shit is burning my skin. <laughs> it's scorching my skin. <laughs> but that is the thing. So, you know, Carlton's got zits. Will's got no time. He's he's into Cindy. I don't know what Cindy looks like at this point. I haven't seen it. But then we cut to school. And uh, Cindy's trying to hang out with Will. But Will's just kind of like spacing out. You know, he's tired. And she's like, man, you better keep that energy up for that prom. And He's like, girl, you know I'm gonna have that. You know when we do, we know, what, what does he say? <laughs> he says something funny. He does some Mike Epps shit. Yeah, I don't know. You know that that thing right there, brother. You never had that right there, but I don't know, man. But just basically That's saying, hot, like, girl, don't worry. I never got. Jeez, I never had a prom date like this where it was like we're gonna fuck afterwards. And if that would wake me right up as a high school kid, oh, save some energy. I got en- I got all the energy. Let's go home right now and knock this out. Cindy's hot though, Steve. What do you think about Cindy? I think both of their prom dates are pretty hot. Good, good, good. Oh, Carlton, you, yeah, yeah, man, good hell, job. Especially yeah. for Carlton, but Cindy, especially I, for Cindy's, Carlton, you know, Cindy's got it. Carlton's got zits. Uh, and as I think Cindy leaves, Will's getting his stuff. He's tired. Is he slow? He's he's sluggish. And then some just typical like scumbag white boy shows up and he's like hey i notice you're tired you ever uh need a little pick me up i got some pills for you does he give him the pills here steve i think he does yeah because he puts more pressure on will he's like hey man make sure you got some energy for the game this week so yeah. you know he, he he's got to have energy for the prom for cindy and then he's got the this big game uh coming up so it's like all right man uh if you need to pick me up i got you bro so they they dip into the locker and he he drops off some some caffeine pills like Jesse Spano style and um now Carlton he shows up and they immediately try to hide it because they you know that he's big cuz man he don't want to like you know his brother his cousins from the other side of the tracks he don't want to get him involved with that yeah and I do like the white boy's explanation I mean this would have sold me he's like dude just think about it as freeze dried coffee dude that's all it is just pop a couple so. You know, kids hanging out. He's giving them pill. I I don't know any drug dealer that's just casually giving out free pills on the arm like this. But you know, that's cool. You're a star of the basketball team. Hey, we got to do whatever it takes to beat Valley or Mommy or whatever. <laughs> Will's got a bat. He's got this whole thing of pills in his locker, just chilling. Then we come back to the house, and this is the night of the prom. Will's just catching some Z's in the tux. He's, you know, he needs that. How tired is this kid? I mean, damn. I know you're busy, you, but this is this is it, man. I I couldn't sleep the night of prom. You know, I couldn't do this, but he's exhausted. And you know, now that Carlton's waking him up, man, he says, "Uh, Carlton, you, you ever think about taking drugs?" And Carlton's like, "Oh, I know what this is about." You think my zit is that big that I'll have this shit for the rest of my life, don't you, Will? It's like, no, dude, no, 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 man. You know what? That's just never mind. And Cindy and Vanessa, they come in looking fine. Cindy's got a weird like Barbie doll dress thing going on. That's kind of weird in my opinion. It's not very prom, but you know, this yeah. isn't fashion it'll, time. It'll get uh, eaten up. And I like as they're leaving. One, Aunt Viv has to get all the pictures. I hated this. As a fat guy that had to fit into a tux, if I was in that situation, like, <sighs> so they snap a few cute pics. <laughs> a lot of that. <laughs> and then Will just says the most, I love, I just love, he's like, this is going to be the best night of our lives. <laughs> now, Will is at the, pr- at the prom and he slumped in the chair weekend at Bernie style. And he's got his glasses on, and they're just like, not dancing. Cindy comes up to him, is like, "Hey, man, you've been sitting in this chair this whole time. I'm ready to get it, get it on on the dance floor." 
Yeah, and Will's like, I'm fine. I just gotta, I need to, I need to get my feet up under me. Then Carlton rushes in, and he's still like, I, do you see this thing? Do you see this? I couldn't, but he needs, he's like, do you have any vitamin E? And Will's like in a daze, and he's like, yeah, man, I think I do. Like, go into my locker. Just, I think they're in there. So Carlton now is going to the locker, uh, and... I think he just scarfs them hoes down. He takes them by the handful. And in the very next scene, hitting the dance floor would be an understatement. He is abusing the dance floor. He is beating up the dance floor and taking his lunch money. He's It's about to like, you can see smoke coming from the floor itself. He's putting so much friction down. I mean, he's sweating. He looks like he's putting in more effort than anyone could or would on this dance floor uh will comes in as like i somebody's like man i think the white boy's like man does he always have this kind of pep in his stuff he says something it's like dude you motherfucker (laughs) he is hitting the roger rabbit the hammer man the charleston the goddamn uh, Pee Wee herman everything And, and he gets extra points for hitting them hard like every step is just like bobby <laughs> cabbage patch uh and then i f- i feel like somebody's talking to him and he's like yeah let's fucking he sounds like he's at a boogie nights party like in the beginning when they were fun when the coke was good you know he's just flying steve i never got to experience what uh, caffeine pills were but these things look fun i mean it looks like a great time <laughs> It's like he's on Adderall or something. Man. You know what? He's on those Bradley Coopers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, dude. So he's, you know, everyone, he's getting the chance. Everyone is loving it. Carlton is at an 11. Will's, he realizes like, oh, fuck. Uh... Ah, which bottle did you take him from? He realizes Carlton's eating the wrong pills, eating these crazy caffeine pills. And as he gets to Carlton, uh, he, he says like, man, we got to go, man. We got, And Carlton collapses, Steve. It's over. He's in car. Like, we don't know what happens. It just cuts. But Carlton collapses. And then we cut to the hospital. And Will's like, I mean, we've seen Uncle Phil go off, right? And the panic I would feel knowing that you're going to have to fess up, I I would probably jump out the window, you know? But, sorry, go ahead. Because that, that's why they want to hurry up and get up out of there, man, so they don't have to, like, own up to anything. Uh, but the nurse tells them, like, we have to keep you here overnight. It's what we do with all of our substance abuse patients. And Will is just like, whoa, 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 whoa. my cousin, he, he's afraid to even take Flintstone vitamins, let alone some some speed pills. Like this was a mistake. He didn't mean to do it. He thought he was taking some vitamins for, for his acne. This is this big ass zit he has. So, hey, let's just let's just come on. L- let us on our way. She's like, no, baby, he's he almost died. And she's like, you know, I think this is basically the uh, dilemma that any nurse has in like these situations, because of course, even if they are drug addicts, somebody's going to say some shit like this, but she goes into this whole thing. She's like, you know, even everybody has these kind of issues. You know, I think Will and I'm like, oh, man, like, let's go. And she's like, no, calm down. You ain't going nowhere. She's like, just so you know, anybody can do this. Me, I went from Yale to fail. I went from the Park Avenue to the park bench because I was into some shit just like you. It was like trying to like tell him it's not over. Um, But I think as she's like saying this and like they're not going to get to leave, Uncle Phil and Aunt Viv show up and they're like, what the hell happened here? And Carlton basically hides what happened. You know, he's like, I, I, maybe he doesn't tell, he just doesn't tell him it was Will, I think. Yeah. So he, he doesn't rat on him. So he just doesn't rat on him. So Uncle Phil's like going off on Carlton, like, how could you be so stupid? And like, Will, you're the best. You're my favorite. You're my favorite nephew now. Thank you for saving my son. You're the best. And so now Will's got this inner guilt, like, oh, fuck. 
Thanks, Carlton. But God damn, because everybody's shitting on Carlton, basically, and giving him all this praise. So yep, guilty conscience, man. Uh, he even adds in, if it wasn't for you, Will, I don't know where Carlton would be right now. Um, and thanks to you, Will, you saved the day. And like they're just chanting his praises on the way back. And then eventually, Will, he's just like, hey, can uh, me and Carlton have some time alone? And he was like, hey, man, why'd you cover for me? And Carlton says, I, I think I might still be high. <laughs> <clears throat> but Will's like, dude, I'm so sorry. He's like apologetic. You know, he's like, dude, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Like, you're the best. So thank you. But man, I'm so sorry you got hurt like that. That's all me. So he's still guilty about it. And uh, <clears throat> but Carlton's alive, you know, like all you got to do is get through this. But the next day, um, Phil's like talking to Will. Will's like, you know, sort of coming back from this. And Phil's like, man, you're the, you killed this. You you saved my son. I want to give you something as a sign of appreciation. It gives him season take, see, courtside season tickets to the Clippers. This is 90s Clippers. So I don't know yeah. the value, but, you know, still season tickets courtside to the to this team that that will loves and will's like dude i gotta tell you something and fesses up spills the beans it's like those pills carlton took he took because they were in my locker i had them because i just there's too much time like, i don't have enough time i was just trying to have like this pep up thing and carlton just he got caught in the crossfire of this and this leads to another classic phil uncle phil just break down where he breaks you down to build you back up steve yeah because uncle phil he's like hold up no no you have to apologize in front of the family they need to know this and you know will he comes clean he said hey you know just all the pressure i've been dealing with between basketball school and work and my girlfriend i i just like i fold it man and like i left them in my locker i didn't expect Carlton to just jump into my locker and take those man and I felt like I, that's my homie I, I let him down I'm sorry I'm sorry you, and man. then it's like man that, that Will and Uncle Phil chemistry it, it gets you in the heartstrings god damn it I mean and Will, Phil just walks up gives Will a hug and that's how it ends everybody else is like kind of like still taking it in too I felt like everybody's like damn that's fucked up what happened you know, because this you almost killed, dude. But uh, man, just I love these episodes where Uncle Phil just is like the ultimate dad. He's always yeah. I mean, this proves it. He's he acknowledges greatness when he thinks it's good. And then when he finds out the truth, he even still gives that hug at the end where it's like, damn, Uncle Phil, you the best, man. When he, he drops that rough exterior and it just yeah that's like, lazy will like all this stuff he said because will's like man i'm just so tired man and like with ba basketball and school he's like that doesn't you shouldn't be doing this you should know better like that kind of shit where it's just like <sighs> that tough love but it's real and, and yeah, you know yeah. i think every now and then we all want that uncle phil hug yeah hell yeah we need that Sorry. sometimes you know you know you fucked up and you just want somebody to be like yeah, okay you did fuck up but we don't hate you we loved you you'll be all you right that's, that's all we need and, and by the way in this screenshot i can definitely see that pimple on carlton's forehead okay got a little concealer on it but yeah maybe a little vitamin e steve <laughs> who knew <laughs> who, who knew but uh, in 1994 jean a releases pronounced jean a and that is the one with, hey, Mr. DJ, and get this started. Oh, I got that red tea, so we can get down here to party. Hey, oh, hey, Mr. Man. That's the shit. I never knew who sang this, but glad to know it now. I'm going to be listening to this all week. And uh, Groove Thang, that's another one of the releases. And, and Sending My Love, I, I can't replicate that because they go uh, like, higher about two or three octaves it's it like okay my Mariah squeak level yeah oh, but it's so melodic man uh sending my love is so dope and uh my karaoke skills it just plateaus at that point 
But uh, in 1995, American rapper Meg Thee Stallion is born in Book Murakil. I love you. I, I love you. I, I love you. Yeah, I mean, just one night with Meg, Steve. I just want to see it in person, you know? I just want to see, I know it looks good. I know it's going to be fantastic, you know, but I just, I want to, it's like when you see like the Statue of Liberty or something, you just want to see what it looks like in real life. It's that big and beautiful piece of art that I just haven't seen yet. It's the sip of her bath water. But just like the good Lord giveth, the good Lord taketh, because that following year in 1996, American actor McLean Stevenson passes away at the age of 68, uh, mostly famous for his role in MASH. Which, who was he in MASH? McLean Stevenson. BJ Honeycutt? J Honeycutt. That's, yep, yeah, that's exactly <clears throat> who he was. BJ now, Honeycutt. He, was he in the movie or the show, Steve? He was in the show. He he was uh, Hawkeye. P no, he was Henry Blake, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Blake. Okay, he was like a dickhead, I think, in the in Mash. He was like somebody Hawkeye and uh, B.J. Honeycutt fought with. If I remember watching this with my dad correctly, that stinks. Yeah, you know more information than I do, man. But uh, he was uh, recovering from bladder cancer surgery at the Encino Tarzana Regional Medical Center on February 15th, 96, uh, when he suffered a sudden fatal heart attack. Damn. Well, my dad loved MASH. What's this guy's name again, Steve? McLean Stevenson. McLean Stevenson. Thank you for your service to this country on a television show. But uh, that following year, 1997, the final episode of Gargoyles airs. Uh, it would last three seasons, 78 episodes. I was in and out with this show. The toys for this show, fantastic. Uh, I think that this actually was a really good cartoon that I just didn't really watch for whatever reason. But uh, I've seen some as an adult. I do remember it had a great theme song, and I'm, I, I like the character design looked dope. It was a change of pace for Disney. This this was actually their first animated drama series. It was, it was, it had its darkness, but I do like the idea that these gargoyles, like, don't they come to life at night? Like in the sun, they like turn to stone, I believe. And then they come to night at life and fight crime or, or something. Crime. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's, uh, apparently they have a lot of similarities to the turtles. Um, in the fact that majority of the story is being set in New York City, uh, serving as the base of operations. Uh, they're creatures that are feared and misunderstood by most of the human race and have one ally who helps them on, uh, in the human world while gaining more potential allies in the future, whether human or not. Thank you, M-Dubs. Yeah. So do you did, I'm assuming you didn't watch this as a kid either. I don't know what it was. Like, um, I don't know why I didn't because it, it almost has like time. a Batman vibe. I think you're right. Like, what were we? This was 97, this, so yeah. we're 14, right? Yeah, this was the Disney of the mid-90s, mid you know. Now, DuckTales, you had us. Darkwing Duck, you had us. Goof Troop, even, you had us. Tailspin. This was the, the next generation, our, our, our little brothers or little cousins, you know. But, you know, if you have Disney+, Plus, you know, I, I watched it when Disney+, Plus was first available, man, and it's solid for adults, bro. Yeah, I, that's what I was saying. Like, as an adult, I saw it. I was like, oh, I wonder why I didn't watch this. Because it does, it's like cool animation, good animation. And it's got some good action in it, too. So shout out to Gar. I wonder how, how many seasons did they have? Three seasons, uh, 78 episodes. Oh, damn. See, man, TV used to just give us, it was a bevy. 25 episodes a season? That's fantastic. Now you get eight. If you're lucky. But, uh... In 1998, No Way Out is airing through pay-per-view. Uh, WWF is putting this together, and it's airing from the Compact Center, which is now Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. It's a church now. It's a church now. The wow. capacity is, is 16,000. Yeah, that's uh, where, where Mr. Blessed. Osteen. Oh, yeah. okay. That's, that, uh, that's his thing? He bought a damn his... arena to do church. Yeah. I love that. That's... I don't love that, but... Where the Rockets used to play, man. Damn. Uh, 
What was the highlights of No Way Out, Steve? I don't. Okay. Well, something crazy. Uh, you know, a lot of the matches, the wrestlers were coming out with weapons. And Kane, he has a match with Vader. You know, of course, he's accompanied with Paul Bear. And at the end of the match, he just beats the fuck out of Vader with a wrench. Like, it looked like a solid hit, too. Uh, at some point, uh, the Nation of Domination, they're having this, like, five-way match. I think it was against... Uh, <laughs> Damn it, I can't even remember who they were uh, going up against. But th there's this scene that, you know, I think you might have seen on social media where Rock is just like talking. She's basically like being sarcastic while Farouk is talking. And this is like the beginning of the rift okay. that they have within Nation of Domination, a changing of the guard of sorts. Um, you know, they have a shouting match and Rocky he kind of walks off. And, you know, as we know, he will eventually become the leader and usurp Farouk. Uh, you, you get to see a little bit of New Age Outlaws, yeah. And they're they're teaming up with Triple H and uh, Savio Vega because Shawn Michaels wasn't available because of his back injury. Uh, going up against Stone Cold and Owen Hart, who I, I think were still beefing at the time. And they had some other guys in there, man. But uh, overall, I mean, I, I would say it's worth watching once. It's not one of the classics from this era, but uh, no way out of Texas, man. You, you got the pieces. And a wrench to the grill if you're Kane and Vader. So I'm going to look for that at least. Yeah. Damn. Somebody who couldn't look for it in 1998 is American wrestler Louis Spicoli because he passes away at the age of 27. Spicol? What happened? Spicol. Uh, he had stopped taking drugs after uh, fears for his life, uh, but after finding out his mother was terminally ill with cancer, he went into a relapse, man, and he died on yeah. February 15th, uh, five days after his 27th birthday, uh, overdosing on Soma and wine, choking on his own vomit in his sleep. Damn. Louis Spicoli. I don't really remember him as a wrestler. I remember that name. What league was he in? He was in ECW for a minute, and uh, he was also in uh, WCW. He was actually a part of the NWO. He was one of those uh, many associates that they had, and he had a short stint in the WWF. But, um, you know, he, he was a journeyman, like a lot of those guys are, you know, yeah. going through the different uh, yeah. territories and whatnot. But any callbacks, honorable mentions, or dingleberries that's yeah. in the woods? Um. Well, I just – we were talking about it before we recorded, but – I, I'm only going to talk about one of the movies. Uh, I watched Seven this week, Steve, a 90s thriller, horror. I don't know what genre you throw this into with Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Kevin Spacey, Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, it's one of, it's now one, it's getting up there in the top 90s movies list. I watched it. I have no negative things to say about it. And I just, it's a such a good written movie and the villain i know we don't like kevin spacey but this guy plays the best villain in this type of movie where he's like five steps ahead of the cops he's planning things these murders and all this and uh the way that movie ends uh on a down on a downer we all know about what's in the box but the way this whole movie climaxes and ends it's almost perfect it's such a crazy like the only thing i've never seen something like this since that was like i don't really like movies like this where it's just like a cop drama type thing and it's just done so well so watch seven if you haven't seen it it's so good oh by the way i i don't not like kevin spacey um i i all he was he's still one of my favorite actors, but it, like I said before, man, it, it's just like critiquing a Chris Benoit match, like critiquing the R. Kelly album, like yeah. talking it's about tough. the brilliant, the, the brilliant business acumen of Vince McMahon at this point. It's it's like you got to try to separate like what I know them for and like, I, hey, I mean, whatever this was, happened in his <clears throat> personal life. This was at post him being usual suspects, you know, this was brilliant, which he's great in. And this one, he's in it, I, you know, I think he's in it maybe like 10, 15 minutes total. 
and the the time that you actually get to see him and the the lines he says and how it affects the story and how it like you know basically ends the movie it's so good it's crazy to and when i think about that now i didn't even really like put that in my notes like the fact that that guy's only in the movie like right at the end and you've gone like an hour and a half without even seeing him maybe you hear him a little bit maybe he calls the cops and says like something but it's real quick and uh you're right i mean you just have to separate the art from the artist and you're he's a great actor it doesn't it sucks it's like talking about chevy chase like you know it's like well i like this movie but fuck what, this guy? <laughs> yeah. what about you man uh 1990 cosby show is airing mr sandman and i remember this because it's the real sandman from showtime at the apollo uh he's one of the dance instructors where rudy's taking her dance lessons and him and cliff they have like a little showdown and every time sandman finishes he's like challenge <laughs> and then he does his skipping but but Cliff, he he does he's not doing any real tap dancing because he's not classically trained. He but the stuff he does is funny. And then it goes back to Sandman and he's like challenge. And then they do this back. Yeah, that was the thing. Uh, and then the 1991, the wedding part two. Uncle Jesse finally marries Aunt Rebecca, and I just remember sitting in front of my TV. She's like, oh yeah, please, Uncle Jesse, I don't think he gets to marry her. Please marry her. Oh, he's going to marry her. He's going really do it because there were a lot of obstacles in the way and they, they finally tie the knot and uh yeah man uh, that's all i got but please like share subscribe and comment and tell your little sister hey <laughs> check out food show fanatics with our guy kendra and matt g with our with our <laughs> she's not a guy <laughs> i hope check not <laughs> <laughs> well, I should check. Like, please check. Check out, <laughs> check out Food Show Fanatics with Kendra and Matt G, as well as Crush Gasm with Kendra and our guy Clark the Shark on podcast. So, this is Steve G and Matt G with Happened in the 90s. On and on. Scissor me timbers!